Hey, and welcome to a kind of edition of uh, Not By Just Calvin. I'm not doing any interviews today. It's just my opinion today. Um, and uh, I will be getting to the, uh, well, I'm just gonna show you one thing. Not that one, excuse me. <laughs> no, I, well, there we go. Today, uh, my ear, there's gonna be lots of strikes going on all over the world, especially here in the United States. Um, I want those that are listening and watching to know that Just Calvin uh, supports every single strike that's happening in every single part of the world because strikes are there for people to express their dismay, their dislike, their um, agitation with government and or big corporations. Uh, I fully support every single one of them because there is there has to be a lots and lots and lots of change, um, especially here in the United States. There's quite a few corporations that in some cases are zombie corporations, which in case you don't know what that means, that means they just barely made just enough to not have to go for chapter 11 and just enough to be able to, uh, to pay their executives above what their, what their value is and their employees lower than what their, what their actual uh, product, productivity is. Another thing about the whole deal is People who uh, are in current office and who have been in office uh, seem to think that uh, like tax breaks for the wealthy, that doesn't go directly to consumers. Uh, middle class tax breaks, they go directly to consumers, directly to families, directly to people who may have smaller businesses who can use stuff like the salt tax, which I believe under the 2017 uh, tax um, loophole uh, tax, the the tax bill that Trump uh, had pushed through, he eliminated the salt tax, uh, which meant that small businesses who couldn't afford or didn't have a big enough business uh, to uh, be able to claim enough tax exemption, uh, like the Amazon, the Google's of the world. So they were left uh, paying out of pocket without any um, deductions of, bit of some business uh, cost, uh, like gas and the cost to clean uniforms and to buy more uniforms to replace the old ones, stuff like that. When, when he did that, when the Republicans did that, uh, they pretty much screwed over smaller businesses that would have used that salt uh, deduction in order to create more jobs by hiring more people uh, would have uh, been able to uh, get old product that may have not been uh, selling very well off the shelf and brought new product in that would sell um, and stuff like that. Um, and taxes that the big corporations don't pay are considered a tax uh, expenditure by the IRS, which means that tax not going within the government entity for whatever, because taxes don't actually pay for any kind of spending. Spending bills pay for spending. Uh, they, that, that's money that goes into the economy and people take it and spend it. Um, the taxes are a liability to give somewhat worth um, to money coming back into the government through taxation. So my first thought on the strikes is how bad everybody strikes. Every industry, everybody, if you're sick of the job you're in, they're not paying you well enough to live off and you have to literally be on the government subsidies, strike. That's all you can do is strike because the company's not going to pay you anymore and they can only pay you less, really. Um, I've been through that myself as far as the, uh, the um, wage deduction um, and or not getting a, uh, a wage increase. I, my, my latest adage 
in regards to voting, which I will not be voting, uh, but uh, for those who do vote is uh, check out Open Secrets, check out who's running, and if they have a page on there, that person is now worth your vote because they will not be working for you. They will be working for their uh, campaign contributors, contributors like the Nancy Pelosi, like the AOCs, like the Bernie Sanders, like the Chuck Schumer's, like pretty much every single person who is currently in office, uh, except for Green Party, because well, they don't take, they actually don't take money from any corporations. If you look them up, look up every candidate that the Green Party has has put up. I pretty much, I can almost guarantee you will not find one. If anything, they have contributed to their own. That's pretty much all you'll find because I've been doing it. I've been looking. I've been looking up candidates. How many Hawkins I did? Angela Walker I did. Man, Hoffman I have. The only persons who have contributed to their campaigns are literally people uh, like us, like the people who would be voting for them. And they don't get much because, unfortunately, a lot of states, they're not either regarded as a top tier campaign or a top tier party, rather, whereas they should be regarded as the top uh, uh, party because they don't take any corporate money. They don't uh, do anything other than try to fight for people's wages, uh, um, environment, uh, their rights to live the way they want to live, you know, stuff of that nature. Whereas in the two parties, they've been trying to take control. They've been trying to take something away from you without giving you much return. Um, anyway, so let's see, go back up here. And I'm pretty sure you guys have seen uh, the thing about Fauci and, and NIH. I'll get back. I'll get to that here momentarily. But as you can see, this is from um, American Tax for uh, Fairness.org. Key facts about uh, those tax expenditures uh, uh, um, known as tax loopholes. Tax avoidance through offshore tax loopholes is a significant reason why corporations which pay one third of federal revenue six years ago, now pay one tenth of a federal of federal revenues. U, uh, U.S. corporations dodge ninety billion dollars a year in tax by shifting profits to subsidiaries, often no more than a than a post office box and a tax haven. U.S. corporations hold two point one trillion in profits offshore, much in tax havens that have not been taxed in the U.S. You see, this is why we have a trillion dollars in uh, quote unquote um, national debt. It's not because of consumer, of consumer debt. It's because of corporate debt. If you are able to find uh, how much consumer debt there is in total, you'll probably get about maybe three trillion, maybe that. Uh, and that's including, I think that's including some mortgages, but as you can see, 2.1 trillion in, off, in profits offshore. You think about that, that in at least a couple, of, at least five, six years worth of uh, three uh, years, 2.1 trillion or give or take. Anyway, so General Electric, which used the loophole for offshore final, uh, financial profits, earned 27.5 billion in profits from 2008 to 2020. <clears throat> to 2010, uh, 2012, excuse me, but claim tax refunds of 3.1 billion. So let me get this straight. They made 27.5 billion in profits between 08 and 12, but claimed the tax refunds of 3.1 billion. That's taking from the government, not giving to the government through corporate taxes. So all of this other crap you're, you're hearing from conservatives and some blue dog Democrats about national debt. National debt is what corporations own as far as their own loopholes that they have that they have been they bought from uh, from um, politicians and also uh, what uh, what their debt is themselves as far as corporations go. I believe it's about still about ten trillion dollars in 
corporate debt. That's ten trillion dollars plus. I think it was like thirty-five trillion that has been uh, spent through the Pentagon on wars for the past twenty-some years. Thirty-five and ten. That's what forty to forty-five trillion dollars in corporate and Pentagon debt. Because as far as I know about, we haven't gotten nearly the benefits from that kind of, through that kind of bloodshed as the corporations have gone through profits. Let's see. Uh, I wonder, that was that one to so, say as far as that part goes. Uh, let's see, but this is a different portion of that same thing. So this is from what are tax expenditures and loopholes. Uh, what some tax expenditures help society achieve auspiciously uh, goals of by goals by encouraging charitable giving or helping families to face costly health and situations. For example, others are poorly targeted, inappropriate, and disproportionately benefit high-income households. Reforms could simply ta uh, reforms could simplify taxes, make the current distribution of income less. Unequal and bring in billions of dollars for governor for government revenue annually. In 2018, deduction credits, exclusions, and other tax expenditures cost the government more than 1.3 trillion in revenue, which is about 6.3 percent of GDP. High-income households are more likely to tax expenditures, creating upside-down subsidies that disproportionately benefit the well-off. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 reduced the federal revenue loss via tax expenditures by about 10% in 2018 to 2020. In principle, an income tax could apply the same progressive rate schedule to all the income a person earns in the year. In practice, our system falls far short of this notion. Largely, this is due to the significant presence of tax expenditures, deductions, credits, and other preferences that can reduce people's tax burdens. People often call tax expenditures loopholes, suggesting that taxpayers are exploiting some unintended or narrowly offered benefit, but many of them serve millions, uh, serve millions of households across most income levels. These preferences are the equivalent of government spending that occurs through tax rules, which, are, which is where the tax exemption expenditure comes from. Tax expenditure substantially reduces government revenue in 2018. They cost the government more than 1.3 trillion in lost revenue, which is about 6.3 percent of GDP, as I just as I just explained. So let's see. Ten largest tax expenditures for fiscal 2010 2019. Exclusion of employer contributions for health care, health insurance premiums, and long-term care insurance premiums, which was 164.1 billion. Number two, that would be rank one, obviously, as you can see. Uh, reduced rates of tax on dip, uh, dividends and long term capital gains, which was $127.0 billion. Tax benefits for employer defined uh, district contrib contributions plans 120.8%, uh, excuse me, billion. Tax benefits for defined benefits plans 90.2 billion. Earned income credit to 71.4 billion, depreciation of equipment in excess of the alternative depreciation system, which was 71.2 billion. Uh, Reduced tax rate on active income of control, uh, controls of foreign corporations, 68.0 billion. Subsidies for insurance purchase, purchase through health benefits changes, exchanges, excuse me, 53.2 billion. A uh, 20% deduction for qualified business income at $48.6 billion. Tax expenditures are tilted towards high-income uh, households in 2019. A tenth of the pre-tax income of the 1% of earners came from non-business income tax expenditures, compared to only 5% of the income of households in the middle of quintile. That's because high income households are likely to use these provisions and because exemptions and deductions create upside down subsidies that disproportionately benefit the well off. Even if tax expenditures reduce taxable income by the same amount for different beneficiaries, they reduce tax more, taxes more for higher income households that, that face higher 
marginal tax rates. In contrast, a dollar's worth of credit reduces everyone's taxes by the same amount, provided the credit is fully re refundable. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 2017 uh, will reduce federal revenue lost to tax expenditures by about 10% for 2018 to 2020. Most of the increased revenues come from the limiting deduction for state and local tax results, raising the standard deduction, which reduces the share of tax filers who itemize, which as far as I can tell are the small businesses, they itemize a lot of their uh, taxes, and lowering marginal income tax rates, which reduces the value of a given deduction. At the same time, uh, the, the, the TCJA expanded the child tax credit and created new, um, a new 20% deduction for a certain path through business income. Amazon, Microsoft, places like that, and places like California and other places that have uh, distribution centers, processing centers, whatever, those kind of centers in uh, the U.S. So, let's see. so what are the options for changing our, uh, our treatment of tax expenditures? Broadening the tax breaks, uh, tax breaks, excuse me, tax base, and taxing, uh, taxing all forms of income at the same rate, that is, closing tax expenditures is generally the right direction to tax reform, and it has much to offer. It raises efficiency by eliminating the need to choose bases based on tax considerations. It improves fairness by not playing favorites across different sources of use or uses of income. It simplifies taxes by reducing the number of artificial distinctions between taxpayers, um, reforming tax expenditures, raises revenues in a progressive and efficient way that cuts a de facto government spending so it can appear, appeal to both conservatives and liberals. Let's see. You can see the rest of this at brookings.ed and the rest of this. Thai U.S. market, job market trigger strikes for more pay. I've been saying from the very beginning of this whole damn thing that in order to get people to work, you have to make sure that their benefits are up to snuff and their pay is up to snuff. And you have to make sure that anybody in the top level um, is not being paid more than what they're worth as far as the program. Otherwise, you get unfair uh, payments. It's just appalling that, uh, that they will would treat you as heroes and not pay you accordingly. Uh, New York AG, Latita, James cheered on striking workers outside Buffalo Hospital over the weekend. And I stand with the laborers, I stand with the workers who represent the middle class, which has been hollowed out and urged this hospital to negotiate with them in good faith and put them back to work. From hospitals to upstate New York, so uh, wait, from hospitals in upstate New York to tractor uh, manufacturers, John Deere, in Iowa to Kellogg cereal at food plants in Michigan and Nebraska, thousands of workers are off the job and on strike across the United States demanding higher pay. We are doing what we need to do, standing up for ourselves, outstanding our ground. According to the Cornell University Labor Action Tracker, at least 176 strikes have been launched so far in 2021, and I'm hoping more, because the more people strike, the less the corporate, the more the corporation gets it, hopefully. According to the Cornell, uh, wait, let's put that. Uh, fueling much of it, rising, rising cost, and but stagnant wages. And the rising cost has everything to do with the transportation, which has everything to do with, uh, like for instance, uh, the. It's been said many, many times in the past a couple of days by me and by others that the cargo ships and everything else that are bringing products in need to be allowed to come in because apparently those boats that are off the shore of California, to say, uh, there's about 100 or 100 something uh, cargo ships full of merchandise, full of food, full of whatever socks and underwear I've heard. They need to come in and be stocked. 
that is one of the ways to bring down prices for merchandise. But it's also a really good way for big corporations like the the Kroger's or Safeways, the, you know, big, big grocery store uh, chains to afford people to buy the same amount of product, but at a higher price. Like, for instance, I'm a big cheese head, not Wisconsin-wise, but as far as the product itself. We go to a Kroger, which is the only, which that and, um, and Aldi is the only two stores that we go to on a regular basis. Cheese, like for instance, used to be well, is still six ninety nine for like say five pounds or whatever, but it's not as much. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not the quality nor the quantity that I that I used to get for six ninety nine. It's a much smaller bag, and I still have to pay the same the same price for it. So that's one one particular um, uh, example. Another example is I'm big on apples. Apples uh, used to be about maybe $1.50, dollar fifty dollars eighty five for two pounds. Now it's about the same, about one point five pounds. Or some to that effect. They had to do more um, sales in order to keep those things moving. Now, if they were to allow those, uh, if they were to allow those products to come in and be on the shelf, they could actually keep the price at the same and still make that money. Anyway, so to see, many union organizers say the members were deemed essential during COVID-19 crisis, but treated as though they were disposable by, profit, by prof, profitable companies. Me, my brother, and sisters with the union have all been here since the pandemic started working 12-hour shifts. Jason Schultz is a uh, forklift driver at Kellogg Plant in Omaha who went on strike at the start of October. The union said the company proposed cuts to benefits and vacation pay. In quotes, I mean, we gave them everything we had and now they want to take all away, take all away from us. This is one of the things I was worried about when Congress failed, or sorry, yeah, Senate, Senate Congress failed to uh, make it mandatory for 15 bucks an hour. This is the kind of shit I was afraid of because the very moment that the, that the economy opened back up, majority of it, or at least some states did, those same companies that were offering higher wages decided to cut benefits and decided to cut wages. First thing I said that was gonna happen was that if the government didn't step in and make it a mandatory for every big corporation to have to pay 15 bucks an hour or more. So what I'm saying is coming to fruition. <sighs> Uh, let's see, at uh, John Deere, ninety uh, percent of the hourly workers voted to reject the company's offer of a new contract that for them last week went on strike. The unions are hoping that they have additional leverage as companies face severe le uh, labor shortages. A record number of Americans quit their jobs not in August because they were not getting paid what they should have been paid, and more. If you are considered a frontline worker, you should be getting frontline pay. And that is when you're doing your normal style of work in the first place. That means you should have always gone front uh, uh, front uh, front worker pay or uh, frontline pay, excuse me. Either which way, those people should have paid frontline style pay. 30, 40 bucks an hour for those who who, uh, who paid 18, 19 bucks an hour. For those who say those big corporations can't afford it, that's, B, that's BS because they were able to give their CEOs and other board members a big pay raise. Same thing with the Senate. The Senate was actually able to give themselves pay raises over and over and over again, but yeah, the consumers actually pay their bills in regards to pay taxes to pay them um, because otherwise in programs, I don't think uh, uh, tax tax money goes so anyway they go through the system and get burnt out anyway my point of the matter is we need more strikes we need more people to go on strike we need more people to show the corporations that do that you can't control us we control ourselves and that's exactly what needs to happen in this case so every single person who belongs to some sort of big corporation if you're not satisfied with your job Go on strike. Show them. Let's see. 
this is the Guardian. Uh, outrage over stall U.S. voting rights bill continues as activists say we need action not live. Here's the problem here. Stop voting for Democrats and Republicans. Both parties have been fucking up this whole country for the past hundred and something years. The only parties I have not are the original socialist and original Green parties. Literally the only parties I have not been screwing things up. Otherwise, get your parties on the ballot and get people to vote for them. Because if you keep voting Republican and Democrat, you're going to get the same shit every time. Literally. Every time. Biden said it himself. He said that nothing will fundamentally change. What do you think he meant by that? He meant that nothing will fundamentally change. You had Joe Manchin who, let's see, by, I think, let's see, no, not that one. No. There was a quote I found that Joe Manchin said that he was not. Now, a couple of days ago, I said that Manchin was quoted by saying that he was not a liberal and never has been a liberal. Now, as far as I know of, yes, and here's a quote right here. Manchin told reporters on Thursday he's never been a liberal in any way, shape, or form. Now, as far as I know about, there are two parties in the United States, two actual like, voting parties, you know. Democrats were liberal minded, which means they want to give people what, what they need. And you have conservatives, you know, people who want to, like, kind of like, okay, well, we can afford this sort of bullshit, which most parties have voted for more money going to the Pentagon when they have wasted $35 trillion over the last 20 years. And then you have, you know, tax loopholes for those who made too much money in the first place, you know. So, yeah, no, we have, this is a sovereign country. We, we can pay for everything that people need. And it's the legislation that needs to be passed to do it. That's why they call them spending bills. That's why that money is allocated to certain programs to help pay for everything from Medicare, Medicaid, um, Social Security, which on that note, I think it was, was it was FTR, I forget who it was, but someone who came up with that, which I benefit from it and millions of people benefit from, from it, uh, shouldn't have sat there and put in that is paid by FICA. If you have put in that is a solvent, uh, solvent, sovereign program, which means this payment is obligated. That means we're obligated to put to pay people this instead of saying where it, where the money supposedly comes from it doesn't come from FICA. It doesn't. If that was the case, then we we wouldn't be getting a social security increase next year because if memory served me right, the FICA uh, percentage has been coming out of people's uh, checks has been less and less and less as the years have gone by. Anyway, so yes, that's one way you can change the whole thing with the social security is by reforming or rewriting the language in that by taking out the FICA bullshit and just say that, this is an obligation that the United States as a country has to fulfill. That way you get the whole social securities and shambles, it's going to be those money, you get that argument out of the way. Yes, but all this stuff is brought to you by the principles of modern monetary theory. Also brought to you by Warren Mosler, Stephanie Chelsea, Mike Norman, and others, including myself, when I have a right. Anyway. So as you can see, he says that he's never been liberal, never will be. Look at his open secrets website. He, he's the only Democrat, literally the only Democrat that gets contributions from the coal and gas and oil, uh, well, more coal, I believe, uh, coal companies. He actually, his family is in the, in the coal mining business. They've been in it for generations. He uh, guess is. His whole uh, trust is out of his name while he's in office, which is good. He did better than Trump in that case, that's for sure. Anyway, the point being is the fact that if you don't just look at open secrets 
compared to whom is running in your state. No matter the Democrat or Republican, look at where the money comes from. If the money comes from the corporations and, and um, industries you don't approve of, don't vote for them. Or better yet, just don't vote for them, period. Simply put. Say. I'm a dream. Let's see, this is uh, October, I think. It's right over. Striked over a full swing as nearly 100,000 workers authorized work on stoppage of. This is from, okay, a couple days ago. Uh, you might say workers have declared a national stri general strike until they get better pay and improve working conditions as former Liberal Secretary Robert Wright. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of this either way, but anyway. Uh, he says, one to say that with employees in the industries across the spectrum set to strike in the coming days following corporate leadership uh, leaders failure to meet the demands for fair pay and working conditions the u.s is closer than it has been in decades and to experience uh, experiencing the general strike i hope the whole goddamn world strikes i hope every industry strike i hope everybody goes on a strike that can afford it uh, Let's see, the United States workers have declared a national general strike until they get better pay and improve working conditions, he writes. No one calls it a general strike, but it, but in its own disorganized way, it's related to the organized strike breaking out across the land, Iowa TV and film crews, John Deere workers, Alabama coal miners, Nabisco workers, Kellogg workers. Now, first of all, the coal miners and Nabisco uh, workers have been striking for a long time. Um, anyway, so let's see. And the Bisco workers, Kellogg workers, nurses in California, healthcare workers in Buffalo, labor advocates are calling the nationwide show of new union power and working solidarity strike October as work stoppages across numerous uh, industries are expected, expected in the coming hours and days in, if unions demands aren't met. About 100, I'm sorry, about 10,000 workers at farm equipment manufacturer John Deere are set to walk out Thursday if the company falls, fails me, to negotiate a contract that satisfies the demands of the United Auto Workers and UAW members by 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday. A couple days ago, Wednesday, or last week, Wednesday. The 9% of members voted on Sunday, 9% voted down a tentative agreement over pension plan changes at what they viewed in, as inadequate pay raises, boosting compensation by 5 to 6%, considering the company skyrocketed profits this year with a net income between $5.7 and $5.9 billion. Yeah. I would probably vote no on everything until you give a 20 to 30 percent increase in your pay. But anyway, uh, we are asking to be millionaires. We aren't asking to be millionaires. Why not? We are asking for fair wages, a pension, and most retirement health care. One employee told WQAD and ABC affiliate in Malloy, in Malene, excuse me, Illinois, after 30 years or more of giving your, uh, your body to a company moving 1,000 pound castings around, casting, I guess, castings around or assembling tractors, it rips your body apart. It's not unreasonable to not want to have the worry in, uh, in life of what if. More than 24,000 nurses and other healthcare workers in California and Oregon are vote, vote, also voted on Monday to authorize a strike after contract negotiations with their employer, Kaiser Permanente, uh, and Seattle used to be uh, group health, um, permanent installed. Uh, the workers are demanding relief from pandemic-related burnout, 4% annual raises, and increased hiring. After voting to authorize the strike earlier this month, 60,000 film and TV crew workers could go on strike on Monday at the they, they already have. If the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, or AMPTP, which represents hundreds of production companies, fails to offer a contract that allows employees sufficient time, workers frequently work 12-hour days, often without meal breaks and uh, get 
uh, only 10, 10 hours off between workdays, while the lowest paid crew members get less than the living wage, according to the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, or IATSE. Uh, strike bar, strike, strike over, there we go. It's a function of greedy bosses trying to recoup the unrecoupable tweeted uh, Jonas Loeb, communications director for uh, IATSE. Also, the point of the matter is, if you're going to buy or it's tough to buy a product that is represented by uh, these corporations that these people are striking, instead of buying that product, turn around and donate it to the to the union that is going that is protecting these workers and uh, trying to give these workers better wages, better benefits, better holiday off, better whatever they get, whatever they deserve, they deserve it all as far as that part goes. And the corporations that are benefiting from it don't deserve half of them half of what they get as far as that part goes. Because they're not the ones who actually work for it. They manage it. They maybe come up with uh, promotional material for it, but they don't actually sell it. They don't actually uh, make it. They don't actually produce it. They don't actually transport it to anywhere or any time at any place. Those are the workers. That's the whole point of workers and management. Management manages the workers. The workers are supposed to be doing the hard work. And these people have done it all, but yet have not actually gotten the benefits that the management has gotten, which is total bullshit. I'm not going to pause my work, my wording, but that's how I feel. Anyway. Let's see. Yep. As I said, the John Deere worker strike after failed contract negotiations. This was a couple of days ago also. Uh, let's see. Yeah, no. This is something else I'm doing. Uh, let's see. Yeah, away from the union stuff and kind of back to the COVID stuff. Um, there's been talk, there's been stuff coming out about how Fauci and, uh, not Cohen, uh, Colin, I think his name is, uh, the, the guy that just recently stepped down as the, I think, CEO of NIH. Well, they were involved in doing what is known as accelerating medicines partnerships. Basically, they get together with uh, corporations or other industries and nonprofits. Uh, this is some of the things they've been working on as far as trying to get some kind of treatment or whatever the case may be. Uh, type two diabetes, which which would have been actually, I think all of them pretty much would have been like. Um, uh, the underlying health risks are likely a risk of being COVID. These are part of the big uh, um, amount of underlying illnesses that, that could help you get uh, um, COVID. And these are the people that are currently involved in sick in said partnership. You might uh, you might actually recognize a couple of them: Merck, Sharp, and Dome Corp. I think they are the ones who own Merck. Uh, you have Pfizer, who is benefiting from it big time. And then you have, let's see, those two. Then you have Gates, Gates Ventures, which is obviously the Gates Foundation, I believe. Uh, then you have um, yeah, nonprofits. Michael J. Fox, unfortunately, is involved in this because uh, Parks is part of it. Uh, the let's see, Pharma, which I believe is uh, big pharmaceutical. Let's see. Uh, that? See. Foundation for the NIH. So even the NIH, NIH is involved in this as far as the uh, getting money from this. So let's just kind of go right here and see. Launched in 2014, the Accelerating Med Medicines Partnerships program is a public private partnership between United, uh, National. Institutes of Health or NIH and the U.S. Food uh, FDA, multi multiple uh, biopharmaceutical and life science companies, nonprofit and other organizations to transform the current model for developing new diagnostics and treatments. Current AMP uh, projects include Alzheimer's disease, uh, autoimmune disorders uh, of rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic. 
Um, the first, uh, when I, I cannot pronounce that, but I'll just say lupus, RA slash lupus. A common metabolic disease or CMD, a Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, and type 2 diabetes. Let's see, AMP partners share a common goal of increasing the number of new diagnostics and therapies for patients and reduce the time and cost of developing them by jointly identifying and validating promising biological targets for each of these diseased areas. For each project, scientists from NIH and AMP partners develop research plans aimed at characterizing effective molecule molecular excuse me, indicators of disease, calls and biomarks, and distinguishing biological targets most likely to respond to new therapies. By the way, they're also calling the COVID vaccine a therapeutic treatment. Um, as far as I can tell you, I think I've seen that a couple of headlines now. Uh, through this cross-sector partnership managed through the Foundation for the NIH, our NIH, NIH and AMP partners are sharing expertise of resources over 500 million to date, which includes in kind contributions and an inter, uh, integrated government or sorry, governance structure that enables the best infor informed contributions to science for all participants. Let's see. Now this is was this was one of the people um, that was in charge of the NIH. Uh, let's see. Go up here. This is what it looks like. This is Francis Sellers Collins. And let's kind of go to let's see, where is this at? projects. Uh, Collins was uh, uh, instrumental in establishing the, Na the National Center for Advanced Translate Translational. Science, uh, which was in 2011. In January 2013, Collins created two senior scientific positions on big data and the diversity of the scientific workforce. Other projects he took on early in this tenure include the increased support for Alzheimer's disease research, which was announced in May of 2012, the brain research through advanced innovative neurotechnologies initiative uh, or brain announced by Obama and Collins on April 2nd, 2013. Now, let's see. Let's get you his actual. Let's see. his question. Okay, so let's see. Yeah. Uh, mm. There was another part here I wanted to look at, or have you guys seen? What if I see? Is it here somewhere? Do, 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 do. Let me see. Oops. Oh, yes, okay. So, uh, genomics, or how you want to call it. Uh, in 93, National Institutes of Health Director. Ferdinand Healy appointed Collins and to success succeed to be James T, James D. Watson as director of the, uh, the National Center for Human Genome Research, which became National Human Genome Research Institute. In '97, as director, he oversaw the International Human Genome Sequencing uh, Consortium, which was the group that successfully carried out the Human Genome Project. Now, let's kind of see what. If I can, let's see. Oh, well, first of all, let's see. In 94, Collins found the uh, NHGRI's Division of Intramural Research, a collection of best investigators directly or directed laboratories that conduct genome research on NIH campus. In June of 20, uh, 2000, Collins was joined by President Bill Clinton and biologist. Uh, Craig Venter, in making the announcement of a working draft of the human genome, he stated that it is humbling for him and awe-inspiring to realize that they have they have caught the first glimpse of their own instruction instructional book, previously only God, uh, only known to God. An initial analysis was published in February 2001. As scientists were uh, scientists worked towards finishing the reference version of the human genome sequence by 2003, 
coincided with the 50th anniversary of James D. Watson and Francis Crick's publication of the structure of DNA. Now, let's see. Uh, uh, you, how, where did I read that? I read somewhere that, that, that his main thing was. Uh, uh, a little too long as far as the actual um, thing, but I'm trying to show you guys that he was involved in, I think it was like genome jumping or something. Uh, I can find it now. Let's see, just discuss the leadership of uh, you know, that. Let's see. No, no, it's a long one, but anyway. Um, yeah, where the heck is it? Let's see, it's simple. It's just something as far as that DNA, uh, what genome. Um, let's see, I saw that already. There's something about jumping genome or jumping DNA or compared to like walking, like they, they were trying to, um, like uh, like the 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 crossbreeding of sorts, like the, the uh, oh man. <sighs> well, maybe you guys can find it on this. Let's see where they have to. I saw it somewhere. I'm not sure where it was. It's not yet. Yeah, I'm not sure. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, let's see, 2017, Collins and NIH looked at the Obama moratorium on being a function research. There's a deemed to be important in helping identify, understanding, and developing strategies and effective countermeasures against rapid evolving pathogens that pose a threat to public health. Okay, so let's see. Um, yeah. Well, I, I thought I found it, but yeah, no, I guess not. Anyway, so yeah, there's a part in here where it where it says that it was involved in trying to try to make trying to make the understanding of trying to uh, research like a bat virus mixed with human uh, not virus, I mean, uh, bat genome mixed with human genome. And see how infected that is. I'm just, I'm just trying to where it's at, but it's like jumping genome or in comparison to walking genome. Maybe it's not in this one. Let me see. It could be a bit different. Let me see. Let's see. Uh, let's see. It might be in this one, actually. Let's see. Yeah, okay, so since he, he was involved in the Human Genome Project, the Human Genome Project was a 13-year-long uh, year long publicly funded project initiated in 1990 with the objective to determine the DNA sequence of the entire uh, Europhromatic human uh, genome within, within 15 years. In 84, Robert Seidman organized a workshop. Okay, it's, it might be in here, in fact. Let's see. Let's see, uh, oh. I something about Let's see. So maybe I missed it. Let's see. Yeah, it was like a music. I'm not sure where it went, but it was like, uh, 
uh, walking uh, genome uh, compared to uh, jumping genome compared to walking genome. I'm not sure where I that is. Let me see. This one. Ah, yes, yeah, so the chromosome jumping, excuse me. Yeah, the chromosome jumping is what they were trying, I think that what they were trying, what they did between the experiment in Wuhan with the bat uh, gene, uh, um, uh, chromosome and mix it with human chromosome to see what would happen. And we saw what happened, it's called the COVID-19. So that's what they did as far as this part goes. That's what I was trying to find. Uh, sorry it took me so damn long, but this is what I was trying to find right here. Uh, yeah, it was like a comparison to, I think it's a walk, uh, chromosome walking. I think the other technique is called, let me see if I can find that. Uh, no. This one. Anyway, so yeah, that, it took me it took me this long, but yeah, that's what I think was going on as far as COVID nineteen. They in Wuhan it has come out that NIH actually did fund uh, you know, the the kind of whatever research, um, <coughs> and that's what happened. It, it looks like they it looks like some time ago they were able to find out that instead of chromosome walking, they chromosome jump. Uh, let's see. Wesman ment uh, mentored Francis Collins, the director of NIH during Collins' postdoctoral fellowship at Yale. Collins called Wesman the smartest guy in the plot and credited Wesman with allowing him to establish autonomy as a researcher uh, in, in his lab. Collins developed the technique known as chromosome jumping. In 78, Wesman published the complete nuclear acid. A sequence of SD40 genome. A week later, Belgian researcher Walter Byers uh, published the genome sequence in additional until a year and a half earlier. Uh, years earlier, the Wiseman and Byers team had been working on separate halves of the sequence. As technology allowed for faster sequences, each team began to work towards sequencing the entire genome on its own. In months, he began. He, he came up with the publishing sequence. Wiseman had to retract several final sequences once errors were discovered. Wiseman was then elected to the National Academy of Science in '83. Okay, anyway, it was none of this really matters as far as that part goes. But anyway, I hope you guys got the gist of that. Uh, again, I'm sorry it took me so damn long as far as the part goes. But anyway. Um, but yes, I do. I do fully support general strikes all over the world, in every country. If you are not, if you a collective of people that are enough to to, to um, enough to disrupt the work, the pro, uh, the production of that company, and there's enough of you to just to do that, and you guys are not happy with. The work environment, the wages you guys are getting paid, and think you guys and know you guys should get paid more. Strike. That's all you have to do is strike. They will take whatever they can, but you you can always look at it in the way of if we don't do this, we'll we'll get almost nothing in return. If we do, if we do do this, then there's likely we'll get a lot in return. So. Striking is actually worth a lot more than not striking at all. Anyway, I'd like to thank you for enduring the last, say, five minutes of what I was doing. But I hope you enjoyed the rest of what I did, what I pointed out, what I talked about, and oh, actually, you know what? Go back to this. Not this particular, but the main story, the main reason why I was talking about that. I can get to now. How do critics say NIH letter defuncts gain of function denial? Let's see. The NIH admit admitted.
Sorry, I couldn't find out where to, uh, to uh, stop my last thing. <clears throat> but I did find another article that pretty much was saying the same thing. Uh, NIH admits to funding gain of function research in Wuhan says EcoHealth violated reporting requirements. So, in this case, the right was right uh, as far as Grant Paul's whole thing on uh, on Anthony Fauci line. He absolutely did. So, so did Collins. Um, the guy I was talking about, uh, a top NIH official admitted in the Wednesday letter that U.S. taxpayers funded uh, gain-of-function research, as the word I can remember earlier, uh, research on bat coronaviruses of Wuhan revealed that EcoHealth Alliance, the U.S. nonprofit uh, that funneled NIH money to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, was not transparent about the work it was doing. In a letter to Representative James Com uh, Comer, uh, Kentucky Republican, Lawrence A. Tavik of the NIH cites a limited experiment that was conducted to, to test if spike proteins from naturally occurring bat coronavirus circulated in China were capable of binding to human ACE2 receptor in the mouse model. Laboratory mice infected with the modified bat virus became sicker, so they knew that it would get people sick. Then, uh, sicker than those infected with the unmodified bat virus. So when you see it was, it was spike, it was a spike protein. They literally knew it was a spike protein. They spiked it. It was the revelation vindicates Republican Senator Rand Paul, who got into heated exchanges with National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Director Anthony Fauci about his May and July testimonials before Congress with the pain, uh, gain of function uh, question. At the second hearing, Paul accused Fauci of misleading Congress by denying that the U.S. had funded gain of function projects at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And the Fox research involved extracting viruses from animals that artificially engineer engineering them uh, and artificially engineering them in a laboratory to make them more transmittable or deadlier or deadly to humans. In other words, uh, the pandemic, as far as that part goes, uh, in keeping with Fauci's refusal to use gain of function, Tabak avoids the term, though the word he described matches his co commonplace definition precisely. A previously unpublished EcoHealth grant proposal filled with an uh, NI, NIA, I'm sorry, NIAID obtained by the uh, Interpol had already exposed that 599,000 of the total grant to the one to a biology was research designed was re was for research designed to make viruses more dangerous and or infectious. Uh, Dr. Richard. E. Bright, a biosafety expert and professor of chemistry and chemical biology at Rutgers University, had previously rebutted a Fauci's claim that the NIH has not ever and does not now fund, does, does not fund, now fund, gain yeah, uh, of function research in the Wuhan Institute of Biology as uh, demonstrated but demonstrably false. L. Uh, Ebright told National Review that the NIH financed work at the uh, WIV epitomizes the definition of gain of function research, which deals with enhanced potential uh, pandemic pathogens or PPP. That's funny. Anyway, or those pathogens resulting from the enhancement of the transmissibly and or vir virulent of a pathogen. In addition to his admission that gain of function research was being conducted with NIH money, Tapak also revealed that EcoHealth failed to comply with his reporting responsibilities under the grant. EcoHealth was required to submit to a secondary review in the event of a certain developments that might increase the danger associated with the research. So when Wuhan researchers successfully bound natural bat coronavirus to a human AC2 receptor in mice, they were supposed to inform the NIH, but they didn't. EcoHealth now has five days, according to Tabak, uh, to submit to NIH and any and all unpublished data relating to this awards project for 
uh, compliance purposes. The remainder of the document attempts to, uh, attempts to prove that the naturally occurring bat coronaviruses used in 2014-2018 NIH rat experiments are decades removed from the SARS-CoV-2 uh, evolutionary, only sharing 96 and 97 percent of the genome. Only sharing 96 and 97. Only? That's pretty much 100 percent right there, not just. Anyway, so that, that'll be as far as the part goes. Is there anything else I want to talk about here? Let's see. Uh, this is uh, Peter Taz, was it Tazak. I was trying to look him up a little bit earlier to kind of see. Now, he has a PhD in parasitic infections disease in 94, uh, University of East London. So he would have known that something like an ivermectin would have actually done his job in this case. But it tells me that everybody knew in the medical industry in regards to uh, this sort of, uh, th this this uh, kind of study, knew that the coronavirus was a form of, of a parasite. Uh, in fact, that's what I remember uh, months ago, I looked up what the difference between a parasite and a virus. Both share the same life path, which means the likelihood of one thing like a like a ivermectin can kill it and has done so for billions of people, multi, multi billions of people in multi countries. So this was to me the the uh, term pandemic. It looked more more likely. I'm not saying it is, but it looked more likely with the um, with the evidence that's coming out. I mean, given the fact that it is a part, it seemed like a, this would be this would fit the mold for the uh, for the um, the internal program that the NIH, the, the Gates Foundation, others are involved in. Uh, it this looks like something that they would try to do to see if they can actually uh, successfully uh, tie something that may have the genome to help with treatments of Alzheimer's functions and other things. They wanted to see if that process, I think, worked. And I think they did that in this case. Uh, but finding any kind of other genome that would actually help in that treatment is far off. But uh, them knowing the treatment or not the, the technology and the, uh, and the technique um, is out there and they know it, I think this, they're going to use this whole whole deadly thing to further that. I think that everybody involved should be gone to jail, should be prosecuted, should be found guilty of murder because they all had a, uh, they all had a, a, a place in this whole thing, especially Collins and, and Fauci and this guy right here. All should all be going to jail, should all be prosecuted for murder, should all be um, the first two should be for treason as far as that part goes, because they actually they were involved in this highly. Uh, that's Collins and Fauci. But anyway, that's just all my point of view. I don't think I, I don't think it, it's gonna happen. I think that uh, they may or may not get off scot free, but I see Fauci be forced to step down. Collins has already stepped down. I think knowing that that's just going to hit the fan here pretty soon. I think that uh, when Rand Paul goes up for election, he will win. The, he, he will win the landslide. I don't think anybody's going to be able to hold a candle to what he's done as far as that part goes. In regards to Biden and other people, I think Biden has a very big, very, very bad chance of winning re-election. I think that right now, those who voted to, um, who wanted to keep Trump in office, I think they, I think they have a bad time of uh, recouping their jobs because what Trump did, whether one way or the other, didn't cite violence, did, um, did bring on violence on Congress who were in the middle of making sure his butt was out of office. Point being is the fact that the reset uh, that may or may not be happening that needs to happen politically as well as economically. I think that 
people should realize that the principles of modern monetary theory are exactly right, exactly true in every form. In fact, every person who uh, knows a lot more about that than I do have been successful because they understand the principles of the economy through that. I think that anybody who uh, wants to vote should definitely look at open secrets and whoever is running that they want to uh, want to vote for, they should definitely be looking at those people and where, where they get their money from. And they get their money from the same people that they are trying to fight, there's why in the hell would you sit there and vote for them? Because they'd be doing exactly what, what they were doing beforehand or the last person they're fighting, fighting. None of that stuff makes any sense whatsoever. So either vote knowing that you're going to vote for someone who takes money from invested interest or don't vote at all. Uh, that and if you want a third party actually involved in the election, uh, electoral system, make sure that your state, wherever the fuck you are, has open primaries. That allows for third parties to be able to get into the whole damn thing. And make sure that whatever third parties you want, whether it be left or right or center, whatever the fuck it is, that they have valid access. That means making sure there's enough membership to make sure that they are an actual recognizable party. Green Party in Columbus, no. We have to grow by 10%. Not 10%, sorry, tenfold. In order to become in order to be looked at as a as a viable uh, uh, party just in this one city. Just in one city. I'm not talking about the whole damn thing. Anyway, think about everything I just said. Uh, look up all the stuff I, I showed you and make up your own mind on that. But yes, look at open secrets for anybody that you are that you are uh, thinking about. Go for look them up and see if they are on there. If they are on there, then look up and see where they get their money from. And if you are satisfied with where they get their money from and you are satisfied with knowing that they will not be fighting for you, then vote for them. If not, learn your lesson and don't vote for them at all and make sure that the Green Party or a socialist party, not, not social alternative and not DNC, uh, DSA, because they're both a part of DNC one way or the other, but uh, let's say the Social Equality Party, make sure that they have more and more members. Those members put them on ballot in every state. Make sure that they have enough of a voter base to be looked at as a viable party. Same thing with the Green Party. Ranch choice voting is where to go as far as uh, as far as how to get a person in, or sorry, how to add to the electoral system. Um, but thanks for listening. I'll I'll be back on tomorrow. I have Jafari Morrison, who I think it's Morrison. Excuse me, it could be Morris. Um, I apologize if I, if I mispronounced the last name, but he'll be on tomorrow night, December 30 p.m. Um, and I'll be putting that on anchor. Anyways, thanks for listening and watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, subscribe to this channel and listen to my anchor.fm/slash Jessica. Peace out for now.